Welcome to today's topic in the webinar series, Hypertension and Atrial Fibrillation, a risky couple, even more when the family expands. Today, Professor van der Giet will present to you extra members of the family, pre-diabetes, diabetes, and chronic kidney disease. Professor Marcus van der Giet is head of the Charité Hypertension Center in Berlin since 2007 and since 2019, head of all nephrological university outpatient clinics across the campus. He has a special interest in diagnosis and treatment of arterial primary and secondary hypertension, as well as diagnosis and therapy of chronic kidney dysfunction and acute renal failure. We look forward to your lecture. Thank you very much for the kind in, uh, introduction. Okay, this is the first slide. I will present some data about the extra members of the family in prediabetes and CKD, also with atrial fibrillation. The next slide, please. This has my conflicts of interest. Next slide, please. First, I want to present a case. 68-year-old made patient, hypertension for 25 years already, medication for 20 years, well controlled at the moment, and he has CKD stage 3B, A2. There's some uh, albuminuria and ID diabetes since five years. There was one episode of arterial fibrillation in 2019 with arterial ablation two times. Since then, there was no episode of arterial fibrillation known. There were 24 hours ECGs made uh, on 2022, one and also 2020, but no signs of intermittent arterial fibrillation. So the arterial fibrillation episode in 2019 was complicated. Next slide, please. The patient presented in 2019 with arterial fibrillation and frequencies of 120 to 130 beats per minute. Blood pressure rapidly decreased below 110 millimeters of mercury systolic. Normal blood pressure at this time was 130 to 150 millimeters systolic. And there was also an acute kidney injury stage 3. There was a decline of renal function from 72 milliliters to uh, about uh, uh, 28, uh, 25 milliliters in this regard. And there was a weight gain of 20, 12 kilograms uh, for cardiac decompensation. The ejection fraction was 32%. So one performed one-time cardioversion with no success. And we had also uh, two ablations at the end, and this was successful. And so EGFR increased to 54 milliliters per minute on 1.72 square meters and also ejection fraction was better. Since then, there was no documented arterial fibrillation episode. Next slide, please. What is the current situation in the patient? Yes, blood pressure seems to be well controlled, also, also over 24 hours blood. And there was a weight of a little bit of overweight in the patient. Yes, the EGFR is quite stable with uh, 43 milliliters. Potassium is okay and also sodium is okay. Minimal leg edemas and the ejection fraction is stable with 51%. The patient has no real complaints. Everything seems to be fine. And there's no hints for uh, episodes of arterial fibrillation and blood pressure is okay. Next slide, please. Medication is uh, complex with uh, some antihypertensive drugs, olmesartan, amlodipine, chlorothalidone, and bisoprolol. He has some diabetes medication, metformin and dapagliflozin. And there's also phenylalanine introduced in the patient, and he has anticoagulant, the real works about 50 milligrams per day. And the patients ask whether he might reduce this anticoagulant because there's no episode of arterial fibrillation documented in the last three years. Next slide. The patient has, when we look at the Kaidigo criteria, has a very high risk for cardiovascular events. He has uh, stage 3B kidney insufficiency, and he has also albuminuria, which is significant to, to um, A3 level. Next slide, please. So the question is, how is the uh, incidence of arterial fibrillation in patients with CKD? And here you can see, if you have a very low uh, amount of renal function below 60 milliliter, then the incident for arterial fibrillation is quite high. Next slide, please. And also, when you have some albuminuria, then we see with higher albuminuric levels, there's also very high incidence for arterial fibrillation. Uh, 
the patient might have a high event rate for a reintroduction of arterial fibrillation in the next years. Next slide, please. We know also that arterial fibrillation and diabetes is not the best company at this one. We, we see the patients who have uncontrolled um, diabetes with very high HbA1c levels, they also have a high incidence for arterial fibrillation. Next slide, please. What we also see that depending on the years of the history of diabetes, there is a much more increase in arterial fibrillation attacks. Next slide, please. What is the reason behind this? We know that diabetes mellitus has some glycemic fluctuations. We have a lot of oxidative stress and also inflammation. And this leads to a remodelation of the, uh, of the heart. We have structural remodeling. We have electromechanical remodeling also the electro uh, remodeling in this patient, and at the end also autonomic problems, and all this might lead to arterial fibrillation. Next slide, please. How it is in CKD. Also, CKD promotes arterial fibrillation. There's a very similar mechanism. We know that CKD can promote inflammation. Uh, it promotes also anemia, electrolyte abnormalities, and also we have a lot of uremic toxins, substance, which also affect the heart, and at the end, we have a higher incidence of arterial fibrillation. Next slide, please. Do we have any hints that there might be some inflammatory response in use introducing the, um, the risk for arterial fibrillation? Yes, we know from the Crick study that especially the interleukin-6 seems to behave in association with the incidence of arterial fibrillation. Next slide, please. Here they measured over the years that those patients who have highest levels, this is the yellow curve with uh, um, interleukin-6, they have the highest probability for arterial fibrillation in the next years. Next slide, please. What is the cause-specific mortality in patients with chronic kidney disease and arterial fibrillation? We see it's quite high. It's ischemic heart disease, heart failure, cerebrovascular, and other cardiovascular. So it's not only attributed to some, like heart failure, it's also attributed to other cardiovascular events. Next slide, please. When we look at specific data from the Cleveland Clinic uh, CKD registry, then we see indeed that the uh, mortality is very high, cardiovascular mortality in those patients who get arterial fibrillation. So it's a real risk factor, CKD, to get arterial fibrillation and at the end also a higher cardiovascular mortality. Next slide, please. The question also is, the patient had, in our patient, he had an ablation. We don't know whether it is a cryo balloon ablation or some electric ablation, but interesting in this case is that when you have had an arterial fibrillation and then you have a worse kidney function, then the risk for also getting a new event for arterial fibrillation is higher than those patients who have normal renal function. Next slide, please. So at the end, this is always the question, is it for the patient uh, reasonable to reduce anticoagulation in the arterial fibrillation? I personally would not recommend this for him because we know that also in chronic kidney disease, we have a higher risk for uh, arterial fibrillation recurrence in this patient. And this also leads to higher cardiovascular mortality for the patient. And, it's, and uh, to recognize the arterial fibrillation in this patient might be sometimes complex. Next slide, please. I want to summarize. Arterial fibrillation is more frequently observed in patients with CKD and also diabetes. With reduced renal function and increase in albuminuria, there is an increase in arterial fibrillation risk. Uncontrolled diabetes, long duration of diabetes are a factor. And the increased arterial fibrillation risk in patients is driven by traditional risk factors like hypertension, but also no, a lot of non-traditional factors, anemia, inflammation, uremic toxins. The mortality in arterial fibrillation patients with also CKD and or diabetes is increased, and the recurrence is also very high even after intervention. So it's very interesting for the patient and very important that we have to control the arterial fibrillation incidence in everyday practice and for early detection and potential early intervention to reduce the overall risk for our patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very, very much. That was a superb lecture.
on a not so easy topic, actually. And the more we see patients with diabetes, the more we see patients with chronic kidney disease, the more we start to realize that atrial fibrillation is really quite frequent in these patients. So diabetes and the kidney um, disease affect the heart in some way. So you touched already quite some on it, but if I ask you in your practice, is atrial fibrillation a relevant problem in patients with diabetes and or chronic kidney disease? And if so, what you just already touched upon, if so, what is the impact of it? Yes, it's, I think it's very important because patients have a lot of problems with this, not only due to the arterial fibrillation with higher frequencies, but the main problem is that they have to take some anticoagulants. Uh, sometimes they want to, to leave it because they take a lot of other medications. So it's uh, for them very important to know, can we control this and to have these anticoagulants at the end? because uh, we want to reduce their mortality, which is even high, not only in diabetes, especially in CKD. So it's very important to know this, yes. And if you, if you see your patients, does it have a big impact, does AFib, on the kidney disease? So it's, it's, a, it's a, how should you say that? It works from the left to the right and from the right to the left. So we discussed AFib versus, and now I ask, the kidney disease versus the AFib. What is the impact of AFib in chronic kidney disease? Yes, this is indeed a very important question because we know that the atrial fibrillation also has some hemodynamic consequences. We know suddenly the blood pressure is going down, as we saw on this patient. Yep. It, is, it seems to be more well controlled, but the patient has heart inf insufficiency. There's a congestive heart failure in this patient, so the uh, the acute kidney injury might be occurring, and also CKD increases. So the patient has a, a, a worse function due to the less hemodynamic activity of the heart due to the arterial fibrillation. So normal rhythm might be the optimal hemodynamic situation and the arterial fibrillation hurts the kidney. Yep. So it's the one influencing the other and the other yeah. influencing the one. And that makes it so difficult. Eh? Where do you start your therapy? What do you target? But I think what I got from your presentation that we start to realize that you cannot just focus in isolation on one organ because they're all interacted. We speak now here about AFib versus, or heart, AFib versus kidney, but the same is, of course, brain, and there are many more interactions, and we become more and more aware of that. Well, thank you very much. I personally appreciate it much. I am sure the audience likes it too because it's such a relevant topic. I want to thank you for uh, doing this with us, and it was a great lecture. Thank you very much.